And then the recruiter kind of looks at me and he's like, yeah, you probably wouldn't make it at West Point. And I'm like, oh, why, I was, that's too hard for you. And I'm like, oh, really? Tell me more. Uh, and then he hands me a brochure and had cadets with, with had swords or sabers. He had sabers on. And at the time I was like, do you get to wear swords? And he's like, yeah, if you're a senior. And I'm like, sign me up. Uh, welcome to the show today, folks. We have a very special guest uh, all the way from Austin, Texas, uh, Pastor Chris Pleckenpool. Uh, Chris is the author of a couple of books. He has um, written a book, Faith in the Fog of War, and Stumbling Souls is Love Enough. Uh, we're going to be going through both of those books and just get a little background on Chris, uh, his uh, military background is growing up. So welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It really, it, it, I'm honored. And uh, yeah, thanks for giving those books a read. That's exciting. Oh, they were a real blessing. Well, uh, share with us a little bit of your upbringing. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, North Texas in the in Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, you know, one of those things where I was born in Chicago, but got Texas fast as I could. Um, parents weren't really super religious. Um, they would drop me off at a Lutheran church and they go have breakfast <laughs> and, and I loved it. I, I would acolyte, I would say for Sunday school, I do both services. I love Sunday morning was great fun. And, but it really wasn't until, uh, I went to West Point in the military Academy where my, and after graduating from there, where my faith really took off. Um, I just sort of was like, man, I, I, I felt just disconnected, um, from God sort of looking for relationship in all the wrong places and, um, ended up going to Southeast Christian church in Louisville, Kentucky while I was uh, stationed at Fort Knox. And it was there, I remember the, the pastor was Bob Russell and he preached the gospel. And I was like, man, this is it. Why? If, and it was back in 1999. So if the world were to end today, you know, we'll, or at the end of uh, 99, uh, what, where would you be? And I, and I really thought about that. And I dedicated my life to the Lord, was baptized there. Um, it just really was, that was an incredible experience for me. So the, the transition from like childhood faith, which was sort of an exciting thing where my, my parents were sweet, moral people, uh, to having a vibrant I, I, I always talk about as if my white life went from black and white to color. It just felt like Christ made everything clear. Christ gave everything purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, it just was awesome. So that that's the kind of the salvation in a nutshell story. Yeah. So from there, you uh, you enrolled it. Was it West Point? Yeah. So it was after, after growing up, I went to West Point uh, and got a degree in mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't really, you know, it wasn't like... Uh, I always wanted to be an army officer. I got recruited. I, I had zero intention of going in the army. Uh, and until I went to this, uh, I got nominated by um, uh, Dick Army, who was uh, my congressman. And I went <laughs> to a tryout. And they were like, hey, just, I, I just like, mom, I just want to see if I can do it. I just want to see, I, I had zero, I literally no intention whatsoever of going into the military. I said, I just want to go see if I could do it. So I go to this like recruitment thing. They make you do a whole bunch of drills on a basketball court, pull ups, throw how far you can throw a basketball, shuttle drills, you know. And I scored well on this drill. And then the recruiter kind of looks at me and he's like, Yeah, you probably wouldn't make it at West Point. And I'm like, Oh, why well, that's too hard for you. And I'm like, oh, really? Tell me more. Uh and then he hands me a brochure and had cadets with with had swords or sabers. He had sabers on. And at the time I was like, Do you get to wear swords? And he's like, yeah, if you're a senior. And I'm like, sign me up. That's what I took. Uh, didn't know anything. Like, I, I was clueless getting to West Point. And so it was wild. It was sort of a wild ride uh, of just <laughs> cluelessness to uh, becoming a warfighter. And that whole process was, I, I, I'd probably say that West Point was so good for me in, in giving me many of the things that maybe my dad couldn't give to me as he'd never had a father. And so, the structure and the discipline and the follow through was just really a real gift for me. So I was just grateful uh, to have that opportunity and uh, I made it. <laughs> yeah. And you learned a lot of lessons of leadership there. I know uh, the first year that you were there, what, 
what's the word? Is it plebes? Yeah, plebe. You just learn how you are. You learn how to follow. You you learn how, you know, as a as a senior in high school, you think you know everything. You you think you've got it all together, and then going to West Point and just every one of your flaws being brought up to the surface, you realize how far you have to go, especially when you're surrounded by just some of the best minds, athletes, you know, you're coming from my little high school in Texas to West Point and everybody was a star, whatever, every, everybody was a valedictorian. And I'm like, Oh, I graduated sixth in my class. You know, I got, I was like, Oh, you're, you know, anyway, it was, it was wild. So that was a wild uh, experience of just really unique, amazing people, um, really unique and amazing, gifted people to be around. And, um, and, and at the same time where I, I think I saw the first real Christians who were following hard after Jesus that perked my, mm. uh, curiosity to follow, find out more about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So from West Point, what was the next step? Yeah, I went to Fort Knox and there in Kentucky and that's where I went to Southeast Christian Church in Louisville. And man, it was there that gave my life to Jesus. Uh, at, at that time, I, you know, I, I think what really, there was another piece of this that I had a West Point classmate of mine who was at Fort Knox with me. And uh, he was reading How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I started making fun of him for it. I was like, mm -hmm. that is a really, and then, of course, he's like, no, nah, man, you need to read this book. I'm like, no, nah, all right, Norman Vincent Peale, you're like you're a million years old. How can this possibly relate to me? And then, of course, I loved the book, and I was like, and it turned out every time you turn around at the end of chapters, he'd always sort of reference God in, in everything that last chapter really spoke to me. And I was like, okay. And I started reading more and more spiritual, more and more self-help books, which all, oddly, I know it's weird, the self-help books sort of pointed me towards Jesus, which is sort of probably the backwards way of it, how, because I can't think of any now. I've never recommended a self-help book to anybody, but uh, there I was reading all these self-help books that really pointed me. I don't know how, maybe it was just my spirit to, I need to get to, to a church where they preach the the gospel and have an understanding of, of who Jesus is. I think a lot of those self-help books, uh, they might not quote uh, scripture and verse and all that, but a lot of that's just pulled straight out yeah. of the scripture. You know? All truth is God's truth, right? So, <laughs> as as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And you can write a dozen books, on that, books on that. There you go. Yeah, that's it. And I think the only difference is those are man centered as opposed to God centered. And so you end up being your own savior in a self help book, whereas um, ultimately with Christ, you know, you need a savior. Mm -hmm. So you, you, uh, you were in Korea at one point, and you yeah. were. This is uh, maybe getting ahead of you here, but uh, trying to follow the timeline. And uh, you were uh, going to go into the ministry, yeah. and uh, you thought, "I'm going to devote my life to the gospel ministry at this point." And you received a kind of an important phone call. Yeah. So it, it was strange. <laughs> it was so strange. Uh, I got told that my unit was getting ready to go to war. I was like, I thought I was, I was going to be here for a year, uh, you know, a year in Korea and head back and, and Korea, although it's on the DMZ or, or where I was, was on the DMZ. It, it wasn't, you know, it, you'd have, you'd rattle your saber a couple of times whenever Kim Jong-il or Kim Jong-un, you know, said something. But other than that, it was, there was no violence. And so, it there and we were already deployed so there was no thought of you would deploy from a forward deployed zone on a dmz to uh iraq but sure enough that they called my unit and i had just taken command of that company like 12 days earlier so i just taken command had gone out to a gunnery which just means we shot all our tanks and we all qualified and and i think that might have been the reason why obviously god had the whole thing orchestrated but it was really a fascinating deal that uh, I, I got to, and I, and I really think it was a privilege to be able to lead men in com combat. It, it, um, as weird as that sounds, it was truly an honor and I loved every second of it and I would do it again in two shakes of a lamb's tail. So I, like, to me, it was really a special, special experience. Yeah. So, um, the book is, is really a, a diary, a devotional really of your walk with God for, I, I guess it was approximately about a year and a half. And 
just really how the Holy Spirit would uh, speak to you, bring things out uh, that you were recording throughout this. And, uh, you know, I, I would say it's the first devotional I've read that uh, that was the setting, uh, which I found really um, kind of reminded me of the Psalms, you know, if I go, where can I go from your presence, God? So here you are in this uh I guess it wasn't a God forsaken country in that sense because God was with you, but absolutely. But from every other sense of the word, you're looking around, it's trash, it's war torn, you know, the, the scenes of bullet filled, bullet riddled buildings, cars laying on the side of the road that had been exploded, you know, a week earlier or two weeks earlier are just there, potholes everywhere, not from the wear and tear of vehicles, but from bombs, you know, that that's, that's what we walk into. And so it was anything but a place where you're like, ah, paradise. So yeah, I, but again, it was, uh, the harder the experience, the more you're leaning into Jesus. I remember when I was at ranger school, like there would be times where I pray over every bite you know, just thank God I get to eat this. Thank you, Jesus. You know, mm. it, it's that sort of thing that that makes a man start to rely on and can trust. Like, you're, I think this is where people don't understand hard times, especially as our culture gets weaker, yeah. is you don't understand that God allows you to go through hard times so that you can strengthen your faith. Usually, and I think people that have been through hard things know this, but if if you're always afraid of hard things, what you're what you're afraid of is the growth. What you're afraid of is uh, is God taking you through something to make you stronger, and and that's probably the same people that are afraid to go to the gym. It's probably the same people that are afraid to pick up a book. You know, there's there's a lot of things that are hard in life, but if you value the results on the other side, then you're going to go through it. And I think that's that's where for me, just I'm so grateful for that experience of combat because it truly brought me closer to God. Yeah, I've heard it said before that God does his best work in our worst times. Yeah, oh, that's uh, good. So so you're you're the commander there, and uh, you were um, assigned to, was it, protect a strip of, of, of road between, was it Fallujah and Ramadi? Right, yep, and it was called Route Michigan uh, for those that were in the Al Ambar province and, and may recall that. But, yeah, Route Michigan was the, was the location is right, Camp Habania and— Al uh are it were the were the two little camps that sort of were connected, but ours was like a teeny little old Iraqi slash British Air Force base, and um, yeah, from there um, our tanks would roll out in the sector, and in sector it was just you know the the cities along the way that connected up to the you know the border of Ramadi, and uh, just kind of out to the east a little bit was Fallujah. And so that was sort of like our our day to day of you it would be a sniper, it would be an RPG, it would be a an IED that was sort of what you were facing day to day. And you know, there's sounds that that makes. It goes oh, it's it's kind of like you know the Fourth of July in many ways of, of the way things sound of of the swoosh of an RPG, you know, but and then impact it explodes. Um, there's the way the IED sort of rattles your brain, um, uh, the way the the fear that a sniper can put into your heart because you, you have no idea where the shots are being fired from mm -hmm. when you're in an already really loud vehicle that's you just notice things moving. You can't hear anything. So, yeah, it, it's it's sort of a wild deal on on all of that, all, all those fronts of the stress that's induced from seeing people die, the, the stress that's induced from being away from family and loved ones back home. And like, it's like putting your life on hold while you go on a great adventure, but still something that's not progressing your life forward back in the uh, material or vocational or any other sense back in uh, the U.S. So I, I believe it's on your first uh, first day actually in command and uh, you're out, it's, it's very hot. Uh, I think you noticed the the temperature was what was it 120 or something like that, and the heat was flying off of everything. And you see heat waves, and you know, usually you see heat waves at the airport from behind an engine of a of an airplane. It's because you know it's it's like the, the air is moving, but when you just see air moving because you're just outside, 
that's hot. And so to take that on top of it, you're inside a tank that is a huge piece of insulated, depleted uranium. That's mm -hmm. hot. Uh, and so everything is hot. It, the, the metal is hot to the touch. So you definitely have to wear gloves and everything's fully covered. You'll get sunburned in a second if you don't cover up. Um, yeah, it's really hot. And then as I'm watching my tanks roll out in the sector, it was 1400 and at 1404 sort of glanced down at the watch just to kind of check everything and we're getting i was feeling really good about us because this is our first day to be <laughs> on our own in combat and then boom a massive explosion erupts about a mile a ah, mile and a quarter out and uh immediately i'm like oh man this is happening i grab all my gear helmet uh, my vest um my weapons and I sprint down to my tank and I'm running as fast as I can. I'm kind of like motioning to, to the, to the tank. They haven't fired up the tank yet. They don't, they heard, but they don't know what that means. You know, there's lots of things that explode. And so I'm like, let's go, let's go. And we get in there. I've got my interpreter with me and we are racing down as fast as we can to get out there. And as we're going out of the West gate, another tank is coming in and I'm trying to, I'm like yelling at the tank, like, what are you doing coming in? And then I realize that's the tank that got hit. Hmm. And Sergeant Ballant, who was the tank commander is no longer in the hatch. He's now dead inside. And uh, I'm sitting there sort of like, as I, you know, at first I'm like, Hey, move out of the way. And, I, and then I realize, and I'm like, Oh, and then you know, there's all this emotion floods your mind and you're and you sort of want to just like take a moment like gather yourself figure this out but you can't because you got to get outside the west gate we're taking small arms fire machine gun fire from the north euphrates river we start to lay down suppressive fire we've got i'm calling out target reference points or trps and then eventually we're saying well we can't just sit here the the enemy is withdrawn to the north let's go get them so we 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 chase and hot pursuit and i jump off the tank i'm starting to search house to house to house and we find nothing. So after like seven hours of sweat and searching and, you know, a man dead, we got nothing to show for it. Um, that was hard. Uh, and, uh, you know, that night was kind of an emotionally draining time of uh, you, you're kind of sitting there trying to figure out what you're going to say to the men. I'm writing a letter home to Sergeant Blount's wife, uh, Michaela, and daughter Sarah and explaining them how you know I let their father and husband die <sighs> and then I uh I mean this is day one like you know you don't even have time to process like my stuff's still not unpacked yet and I'm uh I'm getting my men out together and I'm like guys we, we you know kind of rally the troops moment there's still men out in sectors hey guys there's men out in sector a lot of you guys we we got hurt today and we're going to deal with the memorial and we're going to grieve. We're going to, we're going to have to make time for that, but we need to do what, what um, our role here is for the next 364 days is we're going to go out and we're going to go defend Iraqi freedom. And that's what we're here to do. And so I need you to, um, to find your courage and I'm willing to pray with you. I'm willing to do whatever with you, but we got to go out back out there. And there, there are guys, I'm not going back out there. I'm not going back out there. There's real fear. Wow. Um, you know, and that's where, again, this is where the gospel message yeah. it, it has to penetrate every place because at some point you go, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no, no evil for I know you are with me. Your rod and your staff come for me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness will mm -hmm. follow me all the days of my life. I'll land. I'll live in the land of living, and I, th I think there's that moment where you're wanting to experience sort of like that, but you're confronted by heat and suffering and pain and loss. Um, and so, is God good? And I think a lot of I've talked to a lot of soldiers. They lost their faith through going uh, to places like Iraq. But where that for me, it was strength. I always tell people going in the military: if your faith is weak, you'll lose it. If your faith is strong, it'll be like rock solid. Um, but yeah, it was a hard road. Day one made it hard. Um, 
And so you had fear instilled uh, with your men right from the get go. They were sort of like terrified of of going out there. And you had to really encourage like this is we're going to go in and out there every day. And shoot, 23 days later, I lost my second soldier. Like he he died just in a really horrific way, picking his body up off the battlefield was super hard. And um, man, and so within a, the first month, we've lost two. And that set the tone of like, we need to be aggressive on offense or defense, what do you want to call it? And we need to go find, take the battle to the enemy. Um, and the whole time, really kind of re reminding the men, we're not here to uh, make casualties. We're here to defend freedom. And then ultimately I wanted to point everyone to Christ. So, you know, no matter what your role is, no matter what job, and I, the, the more violent it got, the more I was able to talk about Jesus and nobody cared. Like I did, I just had zero, like, um, oh, you can't say that. Don't tell them you can pray for them. Like never did I ever worry about that. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of like one of those things where like, the more intense it is, uh, the easier it is to share your faith. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, uh, you you had just a momentary little crisis of faith yourself. I, I believe I read and that you yeah. felt like God God was on vacation. Yeah, where are you at, God? Like all this insanity is happening, and and you know, and now what are you going to do? Um, and thankfully it was fleeting, but it, it would come back. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like those moments of thoughts of like man, what's going on? Mm -hmm. I think that, that that's where it gets hard uh, to sort of, when hard things happen, it's, you know, when you live in the land of suffering, it can get confusing on what's God and what's not. And did I cause this? Whose sin was it that caused this person to die? You start asking those questions, right? And you need to trust the sovereign hand of God, the goodness of God, the things that, um, don't always necessarily make sense uh, logically or on paper, but man, God has a plan. And I think that for me was really helpful to trust in his sovereign hand. That that's what helped me walk through that, that God has not sort of like, oops, I didn't realize this was going to happen. It became more like, Oh, like I need to lead into God. Cause even though it feels like he isn't here, I know that's not true. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you've got to rely on God's word and his faithful promises that, you know, it's not like God didn't do war. You know, as you read the Bible, war is like yeah. a common thing. You're like, sure. you're, you know, it's real. In fact, most of life has been war up until like the pox Americanus, right? You know, like, you know, whatever that is, right? So I feel like that's where you, when you live like that, where death is not, is like seen as this something that happens to other people and won't ever hit you. You have this, uh, the, the fear heightens a little bit. Um, so yeah, that, that was powerful for me. Um, and I, I think that whenever I lost another soldier, uh, in May of 2005, um, man, it was May 8th. And I remember I made the choice I, I got a report that we had a, a couple bombs going off in the cemetery that was well known for enemy activity. And uh, I was, I remember we were trying to fix one of our machine guns. We we're in our tactical operations center. And, and uh, one of the sergeants was like, sir, this, here's this weapon. It's called the crow and it's remote controlled machine gun, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, we need, we need this. And can we get it fixed? When are we going to get it fixed? And then I hear the boom go off and I go, Hey, what, What's the ID? They, they tell me that they reference with the grid where it's at. I say, oh, that's the cemetery. Okay. Uh, send two Humvees in. I want them to do a standard search. I want them to search any place that might have line of sight to where the bombs went off. Because that, wherever the line of sight is, you have to have line of sight for bombs because you need to record all of the explosions to get paid by Al Jazeera, right? And, <laughs> and uh, that, that's how you get, that's how you make your money as a terrorist. You got to have someone to show off that you, you know, hurt, killed, whatever. So they go in there, they start before they can get up to the, the high, the high ground, man, they, they had two trucks just get um, hammered and one uh, truck lost uh, two men. And that was challenging. That was challenging. That, that's that moment where I'm like, I had to remember that a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground apart from our father's will. And that to me, it was like, powerful yeah and you uh you took a chair uh started praying and you would go uh, to a certain location there at your camp base 
and you would sit there, and uh, I believe if I understood right, you would just like talk to God. It would be an empty chair you put there, and you prayed for was it a period of time to yeah. tell God what's going on. Yeah, I would set my timer for an hour, if you can believe that. Uh, and I would take two chairs, sit them one in front of the other, and I would just sit there, and I would talk to God. Sometimes I'd journal. Sometimes I'd talk out loud. Sometimes I'd read God's word, but I would just sit there. for, And I would like, sometimes you'd be like, got nothing else to say but i i had i just knew i needed to be in the presence of the lord to be able to go into the presence of the enemy so mm -hmm. the, the presence of the lord is what fueled my um my presence the presence of god i mean oh you know and now you know it's interesting now my my quiet time, I've, I've sort of taken a different posture and I'll get on my face before God. And I do 30 minutes on my face before the Lord uh, and then read God's word and then journal. But then at that time, I was just like, God, I just need a friend I can talk to because it's lonely when you're in leadership. It's, it's like, who do you have that, that like you can share, you know, gripes go up, not down. And, yeah. uh, and so, and in my unit, it wasn't like I was, I was seeing my commanders all the time and they're not exactly the most like, Oh, I feel so sorry for you. You know, uh, that's not the environment for that. And so I really had to kind of take all my troubles to the Lord. I can really relate to the Psalmist. Um, you know, the enemy is, you know, waiting for me. The enemy taunts me, the enemy, like mm -hmm. just all the times when David sort of cries out to God with just some frustration. Um, I got to experience that just in a real way and, uh, God's goodness through it. When you're in a life and death situation like that, and, and most people have never experienced anything like that, or the majority of people have not, did you find that as, um, as your men, as time went by, that, that that was kind of an open door to share the gospel? Were they more receptive, or did they get hardened from uh, seeing uh, death and, you know, tragedy? and? Yeah, like I said, some got hardened and some got more open, but... Um, but the cool thing is they, they knew I believed and they wanted me around. So what that meant, they felt like if, if they were with me is, and, and this of course is almost pure superstition, but, uh, it's, it, you know, it, it's, they were like, Oh, the, and the commander's here, he knows Jesus and we're going to be okay. Uh, sometimes guys would like, I get off the tank and I have one of my, soldiers follow me and he would literally step in the like he was terrified of getting hit by an id so he'd wherever my foot was he put his foot there because he knew that was the only place that was safe and i guess i you know partly because i was 20 you know my 20s and so you have no fear of anything when you're in your 20s uh i didn't have that fear i would just walk into the valley of shadow of death and um sort of enjoyed that i know that sounds that sounds bizarre um but i loved the the aspect of being on the front line i love the aspect of the danger uh not so that as looking for thrills but because it was just a greater chance to trust jesus and i know again that sounds bizarre but yeah and the soldiers they they wanted to be around me um they they didn't mind my talking about jesus for the most part sometimes some guys that we had you know satanist guys that would get irritated every now and then but even then, even then, they would be like, okay, you know, it is what it is. Um, it, it, it can't hurt. Yeah, it can't hurt. But, you know, there were some people that, like, were anti-Jesus, like like Satanists. So, and I was like, yeah, you'll get over it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's, that's – and, of course, the gospel of pornography is all throughout the military. And so that's where a lot of guys were putting their hope. And so when you can – and, and the, no matter who you are, pornography makes you feel dirty, right? Like that – so that reality of where these guys were at, where they didn't, they had, they had no solace for their soul and the the place where they found comfort only made them feel worse. And so that darkness, you know, when you bring light into that, it's blinding light, even, and that's what everybody on the planet, especially in those environments need. They need Jesus. Well, speaking of pornography or scantily clad women, uh, some of the devotionals, we'll, we'll kind of delve into some of those, move, move into that. And Jesus versus Jenna Jameson. Yeah. If you don't know who Jenna Jameson is, that's a porn star. And yeah. so guys would have, you know, they have Bible verses up and then they have Jenna Jameson up right next to them. You're like, well, 
that's my coping mechanism over here is Jenna. And this is my Bible verse. That's Jesus. They can go together, I guess. Yeah, it's just a wild world. And I, I wish I could say that our culture isn't like that now. But as a pastor of a church, what guys do on Saturday night and then they come to church and they're like, hey, I love Jesus. Um, the reality is nothing changes. People are people everywhere. Um, and, and, and to be fair, the darkness of our heart, we're just depraved people, broken people who need a savior. And so you always run to your functional things that you can see and people were. And so my hope was to kind of just jump on those Bible verses and then go, Hey, let's, let's investigate more, um, as opposed to shaming them for what is almost, you know, oh, ubiquitous with, with the military, which is pornography. <laughs> yeah. Another chapter that our or a day in a diary was I thought was really powerful was search again. So you're you're in uh, looking for uh, enemy combatants, insurgents. You're inside of a house, and so you send one person in to search. He finds a few things. Uh, you I guess you're not satisfied. You send a second one in. He's not satisfied, yeah, or you're not satisfied. He finds a little bit more, and a third one, and. Uh, share with share with us like how the Holy Spirit spoke to you during that whole process of uh, uh, trying to tear the place apart and find uh, ammunition and weapons and so forth that were going to be used against our troops. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know it's funny. Yeah, you know, what's true then of like you know the search is true of my kids now. <laughs> Honestly, like you know, like hey, I can't find it. Go look again search expecting to find you know like and i think what happens when you don't think anything's going to be there you won't find anything and i, I the, the truth that comes out like when we're expected to find like when this is why if you have a heart for the things of god and you come seeking him you're going to find him if you have a heart that says nah it's not going to work nah it's not going to happen then you go with an, a disexpectant heart an unexpected heart where you're not going to be able to see it. And, and that's where you, unless you're like pushed and forced, go and search these things out. And that's true of Christians with different scriptures. When you read the Bible over and over again, yeah. you're like, um, oh, wow, I never even saw that. Oh, I can't believe that, that was there. Whoa. And, and I think for me, again, in different contexts, the Bible comes to life in different ways. Yeah. Um that's what, you know, I never would have thought a sparrow falls. To, no, uh, a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground apart from our father's will. That would never have come up to me about thinking about how God is sovereign over all everything that dies and how I don't need to sit there and feel responsible. Like God ultimately is responsible uh, for, you know, the terrorist activity that he allows to happen. And so that to me was like very freeing, but I don't know if I would have seen that thought without that context and then ministering to other people using it from that perspective makes it come alive, uh, makes God's word really come alive. So yeah, I, I love that thought of just, like, just taking like, go search again, go search again. You just never know what you're going to find. Hmm. Another one I think that really, uh, really hit me was uh, time eternity was uh, the chapter uh, earth suit. Yeah. Oof. Um. Yeah. Uh, I think the hard part for me was uh, that was our, our second soldier that that died and um, just picking up his body was literally like picking up his, an earth suit, uh, just the skin. And that's a little bit graphic. And it, it, it's, it was, wow, hard. And like the images of that are still tucked away. And I'd share the gospel with him. Oh, man. A lot. <laughs> I, I, he, he had come into my office and was just being silly. And I took that opportunity. He's like, all right, buddy, you know, uh, soldier, private Tickham, you know, Hey man, uh, what would happen to you to, if you, if you were to die? He's like, sir, I'm not going to die. I'm too young to die. And uh, I was like, okay. And so I, I was like, listen, Jesus died on the cross for all your sin. He rose and like, sir, that that's your thing. Uh, that's not my ideal. I'll get to that stuff when I'm older. And I'm like, man, eternity is now. Like today is the day of salvation. And I I, I really leaned in on it. And, uh, and he goes, I just remember him going, sir, can I go now? <laughs> I was like, yeah. 
And man, when we picked up his body, all that I thought about was like, do you think maybe that after he heard, you know, about Jesus from me, like they took those words and maybe just before he died, he called out the name of Jesus, maybe. But all I know is that the last thing he did was reject Christ. And, you know, on the on the good side of that is like I shared it with him on the bad side of that. What does that mean? And I think that's where nobody wants to hear that people are going to go to hell. That's just not a... um it's an inconvenient truth. <laughs> it is. It's, it's a, it's don't, a reality. Don't preach that from the pulpit. Yeah. Yeah. And like, people just are like, they don't want to hear that like life and death and eternal things are everybody spends eternity somewhere. Hmm. And you have the choice of heaven or hell. And man, I, I want everyone to go to heaven. So I'm going to share that message of hope with everyone that I think I can get to hear. So yeah, that that earth suit moment was powerful. And 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 the one thing I, I now after going to seminary, I was like, I'm not saying that your body is bad or your body's not going to be glorified. One day your your body's going to be in heaven, um completely completely glorified. But man, God's giving you a limited time here on the planet to have access to him. And so while today is still today, repent. Turn to Jesus. And Turn from your sin and, you know, being your own king and let him be king. So that's not to get too preachy, but that's me. Well, that's <laughs> well, I think a, another uh, one of the devotionals in there that I think everybody can relate to and it convicted me because I think often we kind of joke around and we'll say things and it's just all fun and games and jest yeah. and, and uh, I think nothing of it. I'm just kidding, but there's an offense there, there's a, a hurt there. And so I think you call that every careless, careless word. word. And, uh, oh, I, you know, when you're, when you're a funny person or you think you're a funny person, that's probably the worst of it. And you just want to tease people. And you know, that's kind of, you know, with men, especially, you know, I like you when I make fun of you and yeah. all men say that until they get made fun of. And then they're like, Oh, can you believe he said that? And 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 nobody means it like that. They just were careless. But but Jesus, we're gonna be judged for every careless word. Yeah. Sort of an awkward moment to really think that God cares about the careless words that you say. So there's nothing to be careless about. Ah, yeah. And then having to go apologize. That's mm -hmm. always hard. And that's you know, especially when the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart. I remember one time I, I was just I was flippant. And in combat, you try and make jokes about everything because there's not a lot that's funny. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I had to go and be like, hey, man, I feel like I really hurt your feelings. I'm sorry for that. Uh, and one, that's weird to say that to another guy in combat. Two, it's weird to receive it like you need that. Uh, the funny thing is, if if the Bible commands us to encourage one another, to forgive one another, bear with one another, that must mean that person needs you to ask for forgiveness. There's a there's a need on both sides. We need to forgive, and the other person needs to receive it. Uh, and so that that is that was a sort of eye opening thing of like we need to be vulnerable with people, especially in our wounds and hurts. And what happens, I think, for men who've been to combat, they do the opposite of that, and they just get harder and harder over time. Uh, and so it can be harder to apologize, harder to kind of own your own stuff, because that means that you may have done something that you regret and it was your fault. And that's really difficult to own up to. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. That, that, that word uh, with careless words, that's a good in wartime or in peacetime. Uh, Thanks. We, you know, talk about James, the, the tongue and who can tame it. And tell us, a, uh, tell us what a test fire pit is. Yeah, a test fire pit is where you go up. And um, it's just a big berm. So a berm is just a big pile of dirt, a mini mountain, a big hill, just a hill of dirt. That's a berm. That's a, what a test fire pit was there. And you'd shoot into it. And then after you shot your rounds, you'd head off into sector. That's what a, that's what the test fire pit was. Just kind of make sure everything is working before you go out. That's right. And so you had some reservists who oh, were... Uh, uh, they were occupying the test fire pit and, uh, man. Yeah. I, I did not, that was not one of my best days. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, 
Yeah, I you know, we had some action out in the sector. I I had to get out there fast. I come up to they're using a test fire pit as a firing range. And I'm like, this is <laughs> this is where you test fire, not where you line up soldiers and shoot. Like this was I was like, you know, you're just sort of irritated at the existence of, you know, reservists because I don't know why, because you just think you're awesome. And so uh it was sort of sad. Anyway, so I kind of motioned them over. I'm like, hey, can you move your people out of the way? I need to test fire. I need to get out in sector. There was action out there to get to. Or no, I think at this point there weren't there was no action. I was just irritated that they they were out there existing in my place. Because what if there was something I had to get to? Anyway, uh, they don't move very fast, and I get off that tank and I start yelling out, get out of I'm the company commander, blah, 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 blah. And uh, what a, and then the first sergeant, who's like the senior guy, he's like 20 years older than me, but I'm a, I'm an officer. He's a, a non-commissioned officer. And so I like yell at him. He's like, sir, all you had to do was ask. I'm like, I am asking move. You know, I just was like not having it. And I just get in my tank and, and then the the men on my tank, are like, get out of my you got him, sir. You killed it. You told him what's up. And I'm like, oh man. I just the lesson I just taught was like when you have conflict, just yell louder, uh, be more assertive, aggressive, you know, pretty much everything opposite of the gospel. And I was like, uh, I was like, no, wait, it, it's not like that. No, nah, sir, we get it. We understand. You just gotta tell them how it is. And I, I just felt awful awful conviction i was like this is the worst uh and i could never find those guys again i was like i don't even know where they, they were located on our post i was like you know anyway it was bad 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 and i just was like yeah some days you kill it as a christian and some days not so much and so that one i definitely felt the sting of self-righteousness and where that can lead you and take you i, I just appreciate how transparent you were instead of trying to cover up and make yourself, a, you know, Jesus is the only perfect one. It's certainly not you or me. Exactly. I mean, but all of these stories. Uh, <laughs> it's more like falling forward, right? You're like, okay, yes. there's, yeah. oh gosh, it's, it's, it's awful in many ways. Like, but that's in me, like that anger and that stuff, like, you know, it can come out and you're like, oh, who is that? Oh, that's the stuff that's in you that you need to be saved from continually. Like that's the sanctification process. You were, your soul is saved. You imputed righteousness, but now sinful nature needs to be eradicated in your life. And it's still very much alive and well. Mm -hmm. Let's hit one more. And this is probably the one that's really the most powerful. I think you covered this one on your, I am second testimony, but Christ died for his enemies. Now that, that was wild. We had this, uh, so I was out patrolling in sector. We were doing some um, psyops. I had the uh, like, um, you know, civil affairs guys with me, and we were just interviewing local leaders and talking to them. And all of a sudden, we hear this massive eruption, uh, not far off. I get on the radio and find out, hey, there's a car bomb, uh, and um, and I wasn't really sure what that meant. Would that mean the car bomb hit somebody? I'm like, oh no, are there any casualties? Like, no. But anyway, I eventually get to where the car the car is, and the car had the the driver of this car had bombs in the front of his vehicle, and somehow, and this is what's so bizarre, as the guy was driving across the median to ram into one of our tanks, and he's got six artillery shells under the hood. He I don't I don't know if he knocked himself out, but he only made it halfway, or maybe hit a bump and yeah, hit himself. I don't know. Somehow he he passed out. Two bombs rolled out. Uh, the tank that was next to the car shot the the bombs and they exploded, which is what the noise that I heard. And so I show up and I'm like, "What is going on?" And I pull, I pull. I remember pulling my gun tube. I'm like, looking right at the guy, and uh, I could like see him breathing. And I'm like, "Oh, this guy's alive." And there was this like, "Huh, maybe we should try and get him out of the car." And at that point, EOD, which is like the bomb squad, shows up and they put some C4, <laughs> uh, put the C4 on the steering wheel. And he's like right by the steering wheel, which I thought was sort of an interesting technique. Anyway, he's right by this. And they're like, ah, it'll be fine. 
And so uh, they they blow the initiator, but somehow through blowing the initiator, a car fire starts in the, I don't know, how, like it's like how, like he didn't get hurt, but when the car blew or when that C4 blew up, it blew up the, maybe I don't know how it hit. Anyway, somehow it got the gas tank on fire. Well, the, ga- the car starts burning from the rear of the car to the front of the car. Mm-hmm. It's sitting there going, oh my gosh, like, you know, I was thinking, okay, I could probably pull this guy out and get more intel out of him. And I'm like talking to my commander. I'm like, uh, sir, I can probably go and get this guy out. He's like, no, you stay in that tank. You know, that guy could have uh, been watching TV. He's like, that guy could have been watching TV today. And I was like, I don't know. I probably can save his life. And I was just really wrestling with it. And I was, And then the thought that came to my head is like, That guy's the enemy and really from every standpoint deserves to die. And I was like, but Jesus would save me. And I I watch him, I watch him. And eventually I watch the car blow up and it explodes. I mean, boom. And I jump off the tank after it explodes. I run up to where the body is and I'm watching blood just fill up the sand. And that's where just I watching the blood. I'm like, oh. Jesus died for his enemies. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like that, that's God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we we're still sinners, Christ died for us. I, that that resonated with me. Uh putting his body into a body bag, that that thought of like, like, granted, was this a bad guy? Yeah. But that's how Jesus regarded me. And then imputed his righteousness to me so that I wouldn't just not be an enemy. I mean, that's one thing. I would be loved as a child of God. In fact, Matthew 3.17, whenever God the Father says, you know, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. Like, I love you. I'm proud of your mind. John 15.9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So Jesus loves me the way the Father loves me. John 17, the, the high priestly prayer, he prays that the Father would love those who would believe in Jesus through the word of the apostles, that they would be loved even as the Father loved Jesus. And so the same amount of love that the God the Father has for Jesus is what the Father has for me, is what Jesus has for me. That's mind-blowing when we've been living our lives as terrorists, trying to live our own life, our own it's you know cosmic treason and we deserve death and yet Jesus died for me and I can't get over that. That's something that still moves me to this day. Mm. Amen. That's powerful. Uh, just want to ask you, just from reading the book, and yeah. we'll we'll move on from here. But uh, how is Captain Dan? Good. I, you know, I, I see him uh, like once a year. And uh, he's doing really well. He uh, he lost a leg, and uh, you know he and I went to. He was two years ahead of me at West Point. Uh, he actually ran for senator of uh, for the U.S. Senate in Virginia and lost to Mark Warner. Uh, but that you know he's a he's a good friend. Uh, Love Dan, and he's doing well. His wife Wendy. Uh, daughter Anna Grace, uh, two boys William and Tyler. Grateful for them that everything has has gone really well for them, and uh, he's a real man of God. And I've just been blessed to have his friendship. But when he got hit uh, in Ramadi, I, I didn't think he was going to make it. That was a wild thing. I was like, oh my! It was you know that was like jarring um, in a sense, but powerful that he did make it and. And the Lord has seen to, he's now Dr. Dan. He's got his, his doctorate and he's kind of amazing. Awesome. No, that's good. I, I like stories that end like that. It, yeah, for sure. Folks, this is uh, the book here, Faith and the Fog of War, the first book. And we'll put it in the description box for everybody to uh, to look at that. So we move on. So let's, let's kind of jump forward here a little bit. Uh, if people want to get more information on that and the rest of the story about uh, some of the things that God spoke to you about in um, Iraq, they can pick up that book. So you you get out of the service and you're uh, studying at Dallas Theological Seminary, sir. Sure. And you having a a Monday night Bible study on the campus. Um, 
and uh, you are you're getting out of, you're getting out there chris praise the <laughs> lord you're getting out there uh, and this book i'll tell you i, I was so uh, a lot of books you know i can read them in stages but i <laughs> could not put this one down because I had to find out what's <laughs> going to happen to James. I, I read it from start to finish. I got to know I'm too invested in James. I, I, I want to know how he turns out. So, um, yeah. So, all right. So, uh, so while we call that safe place to fall at 7 PM, that was just like, yes. kind of the idea was like, come as you are. There's no, you don't have to know anything about the Bible. And we were on the campus of Dallas Seminary, so I bring a stack of commentaries. So, like, you know, if anyone had a question, like, you can be look like you're the smart guy that has an answer from something you read. That's all any seminary does anyway. And so, uh, I we would go through God's Word and we 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 talk about it, and then you know, you you're not in Dallas for long. You're not in any city for long without seeing a homeless guy. I mean, right. I'm in Austin now, and like they're camped everywhere. So it's like sort of a they're everywhere. So I remember one day walking out of church. And uh, I just saw this guy walking with a, like a suitcase out of church. And I was like, that's okay. I, I, I was able to put two and two together. I'm inviting him to lunch. I hear his story. And uh, I'm like, you know, why don't you come to my, my Bible study? And I didn't think he'd come. I really didn't. I didn't think he'd show. And he did. And he kept showing up. And then eventually. Um, well, he, he made his, uh, if I remember correctly now. <laughs> You have Ollie's man, and he, he kind of throws a little kink in the chemistry of the group because the first time he speaks up at the end when you're asking for prayer, uh, he's voicing his needs. Yeah. He's got needs, you know. I, I don't want to sleep on the streets. You know, I need some money. I need s some food. Uh, I'd like to have a shelter, roof over my head. And and at first, guys give money for a hotel. You know, that was nice. Yeah. And then and at some point, guys give him some food. And then I'm like, oh. I, I was just, you know, I'm a single guy. I got an extra room and you're just sitting there going, Oh, well, you take him out to eat too. And I, yeah, it just, you're, uh, you're Chris, I'm just telling you, you were digging a hole for yourself. So absolutely. At the, after the, you, t you, you take him out to eat and your, your crew does, I guess. And, uh, was it cafe Brazil? Yeah, that's right. That's and, right. Uh, and so he at least is open enough. He says, well, I'm a homosexual. Yep. Conversation goes further. I'm, I'm HIV positive. Drop another bomb on you and I'm uh, homeless. So yeah, he's just, just laying it. He's laying it all out there for you. You had the perfect opportunity to walk away right there. I was like, yeah, I think that's where it almost like ingratiated me more toward him. I was like, I can't, man, who in the world is going to take this guy in? Nobody is. And then, and then, so I did, I, I, I moved that guy in. And man, it smelled so bad. Um, yeah, it was bad. Anyway, so he moves in, and kind of my the rule I had is I would drop him off every morning before I go to class, and I pick him up every night. So like, I didn't want him just hanging out by himself in my apartment. Uh, I wanted him to actually, you know, figure it out. And um, yeah, boy, that was tough. I mean, the and the the part where, as you're saying, each chat, you just didn't know what James would do next, like. You'd you'd find him like, hey, I'm I'm at the library. I need help. And I'm like, okay, you go to the library. What happened? Well, you know, amount of money and something or another happened and blah blah. And you're like, okay, I gotta get him an ID. I don't have an ID. And so you help him with an ID. And every day there was a new problem. It was like it was like a bad sitcom. And uh I'm sitting there going, like, what is happening? Uh and it it really it, you know, there's a lot of things. One, it really challenged me to the plight of those who are homeless, right? Like they, it really gave me new empathy for those who have um, fallen on hard times. However, it also gave me new like reality. Like if you're homeless, you're choosing this. And that was hard. That was yeah. probably the hard, you know, like cause I'm kind of, you know, like every young person like, I just want the world to be a better place. And if we just gave people a chance and, you know, the bleeding hearts of the world unite. And I, I, you know, I kind of went all, I had, I had a cop buddy, Bill, who's, who I mentioned in the book and Bill's like the voice of reason. Don't do it. He's cheating. Yeah. He's lying. He, he's a con. He's a con artist. Bill was never wrong. Like he would like 
don't I, I appreciate what you're doing. You're a good kid. You're doing good things. And I'm like, you don't understand. People can change. No, they won't change. I've seen this. You know, I'm just like, oh, gosh, it was awful. So every now and then I, I catch James on drugs. I catch James drinking. I catch James doing other things. And eventually I was like, I can't do this anymore. You are done. Like you said you would You, you follow through. You're done. And then I kind of leave him. And I'm like, I'm out. And what was wild about that, and what what I found out later, it's just so weird. So I'm I, I lived James with me for, oh gosh, can't remember how long it was now, month, chain, two months, something like that. And then I I drop him off after just kind of come to wit's end on trying to figure out all the lies and all the things. Well, as I drop him off, like God brings another young man right around the corner and says, it, it was like an exact replay. And I don't find this out. So what's weird? So event, long story short, I, I'm, I'm going to do a, the spoiler for it, which I know is the worst thing to do. But James eventually emails me and says, hey, I've graduated from this rehab place and I want you to come out. And I'm like, OK. That was a shock to you. Shock. I was like, I, was like, I thought he was done. I was like, whatever, man. Yeah. I, yeah. I got another life over here. So what I did was I, I go out to the thing. I'm thinking like everyone's going to thank me because I was, you know, I stepped in and blah, blah, blah. Well, when I get there, I realize there's like 10 other men that are just like me. That God somehow orchestrated in this one man's life. Like, I don't know how many homeless people have like a mere, like chance after chance after chance after chance of people, mm -hmm. like people willing to give money, people willing to give time, people... Like I, I was not the hero by any stretch. I was just another cog in the wheel of God's grand design in this guy's life. I was a, a, a sideshow part in this guy's life. And what it made me realize is like, and this is what's wild. How much is God orchestrating the things in your life and the situations and the people that you meet that you never thought would ever happen, but he's got the whole world in his hands. And for his people, no matter how broken you are, no matter how fixed on drugs or even homosexuality like he you know that was one of the things that we talked about his being repentant in that it's another story anyway but like even of the depths of his sin god still pursued and wooed him to himself to this day i, I talked to james about yeah, a couple of weeks ago and he's he's now in evansville indiana of all places and he's now doing well and did he ask me for money? Yes, he did ask me for money. Did I give it to him? Yes, I did. You know, kind of my theory after this was do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And so kind of James is my guy. Like James, you know, if he watches this, like you always got a place at my place. You know, you're my man. And uh, that moved me that his whole life was so strange to me. Uh, but how in the, in the specific way, how God kept orchestrating day after day of every time he'd want to give up. God would send somebody with a message of hope from Jesus. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I like what you said. Uh, it's hard to hurt. It's hard to serve Jesus without getting your hands dirty. Oh, and, you know, now as a pastor, it's like, come on. I mean, it's like every day, like I got in a car accident, but I wasn't dri I was driving, but I blamed on somebody else. And you're like, what? You know, where do I even start with that? Uh, okay. Do we need to go to the police? You know, like that's, you know, you know maybe that's just cause I I'm in the city and city stuff is just bizarre. It's like with drugs and alcohol, homosexuality, prostitutes, there's everything around you all the time. And you've got to have this message of hope and joy in the midst of darkness. Uh, the other day I had a, um, we had a strip club ministry not too long ago to our church. And that's where women would go into strip club locker rooms and just share, like, hey, just want to let you know that you're loved. And, you know, you're, here's you come to church. It was sort of weird. But anyway, uh, one of them got saved, gave her life to Christ. And um, uh, and then, you know, as things happened, faded away from church. And I was going to meet like and that was like years ago. So going to um, IHOP, the International House of Pancakes uh, in, in a part of town I hadn't been to in a while. And as I'm walking in, that same woman that she's Chris Pleckable, Chris Pleckable, do you recognize me? And I'm thinking to myself, I don't like you look like a drug addict sitting there on the ground at the floor of an IHOP. And then all of a sudden it hits me. 
from like years ago. Oh my gosh, that's you. She's like, Oh, I need your help. And I'm like, Oh, end up. And my buddy and I, that was supposed to meet, like we end up driving her down like 40 minutes to her apartment. And she's like, do you got a gun? <laughs> and I was like, can you walk me up to my apartment? Sure. Do you got a gun? I'm like, no, nah, I didn't bring my gun. She's like, ah. and I was like, listen, it'll be fine. I got Jesus. It, it's wild. The, the life of a person who's following Jesus, it's exciting. Like anyone who tells you that Christianity is boring is is living the wrong life. They don't, I mean, they haven't read the Bible yet. They have, they've not allowed the Holy Spirit to come and move them. They, they don't, they don't have eyes to see the amount of unbelievable amount of darkness and the unbelievable amount of armed with good and light and joy that we have and how we can transform the world. I, I just feel like that's, ah, anyway, I, I feel like there's, there's count, everyone has a story to write, countless books to be written about how just ministering the gospel in the day to day is something that, uh, no matter where you are, is it's not only is it great, it's a page turner if you let the Holy Spirit move. And I think just too many of us get stuck. Yeah, there's there's opportunities, uh, next door neighbor, colleagues at work, so many broken people around us. Uh, of course, like you mentioned, uh, you know, driving through Austin, I'm in East Texas, and you know, we it's just tent city down underneath some of oh. the interstates and yeah austin is a wild place all of california just moved here <laughs> well i've en i've enjoyed speaking with you leave us with uh just leave us with the gospel message here for the viewers just uh a few minutes yeah oh man i'm so grateful for just opportunity to share like listen there was a time when i i didn't know how lost i was I didn't, I didn't understand the depths and the darkness of my heart, but God made us to have a relationship with him. And that got broken by sin and sin affects every single person on the planet. It affects, um, affects marriages, affects nations. It's why people die. It's why people get divorced, but Jesus came and he died on that cross for your sin and my sin. When you receive that, when you believe that he died on the cross for your sin and rose from the dead, and you believe it, you get the Holy Spirit comes down on you, you're made new, and the Holy Spirit starts to change you from who you were, dead, to who you are to be, alive in Christ. And that's the greatest gift you could ever imagine. So I would just plead with you, um, be reconciled to God. Why, why let your sin stand in the way of an eternity? without him why like what what do you have to gain by keeping your pride why not just yield to the god who is who's been calling for you for so long to make um to make your heart right with him anyway that's my my prayer for anyone who is far from god who might be watching this my hope is that you would turn to jesus thank you for your service to the to the country and even more so your servant's heart to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. And thank you for your time. Uh, it's been, been an honor. Thank you. Have a great one, Ken.